Today I want to try something that I've never done before. I want to go on a journey through every single Call of Duty Zombies map. And yes, I have gone through every map before, but there was always a gimmick. Whether that was ranking them, or roasting them, or complimenting them, I've pretty much done it all. That is everything except just sitting down and having a nice, simple conversation about every single Call of Duty Zombies map. So today we're going to do just that. I have a feeling that this is going to be a very very long video. This video is sponsored by my Twitter. You should go and follow it. The link's in the description. The first Call of Duty Zombies map was Nocturne Toten. Noct has a feel to it that's pretty much unlike any Zombies map that would come later. It is extremely small and bare bones. There's not much to it. From the very moment you spawn in, you essentially get the gist of the map. You're stuck in this broken, abandoned building with zombies collapsing in on you. The best way to play Noct, in my opinion, is to play it like the way the mode was invented for. I feel like Zombies wasn't designed to be this game where movement was the one central thing that keeps you safe from zombies. The game wasn't really developed for training to even be a thing. So the best way to play Noct is to play it with just the central idea of kill or be killed. The zombies spawn in the area around the Nocturne Totem building and it's your job to kill them before they can get to you. Obviously you have things like rebuilding barriers to try to make that process last as long as possible. You spawn in with just about the weakest gun imaginable in the M1911. In the near vicinity are some very cheap weapons though to slightly improve your chance of actually surviving. However, they're some of the weakest guns in zombies history and they're only meant to really get you through the very early rounds. As you progress through the map, and there's not much of a progression in Nocturne Totem let's be honest, you'll find some better wall weapons like the Tommy gun or the bar that are actually some of the better weapons on this map. Of course, there's the mystery box with some incredible weapons in it. All of the weapons in World of War are obviously World War II style guns, with one notable exception, the ray gun. Now, the term wonder weapon obviously hadn't been coined yet at this point, and let's be honest, most people didn't even call the ray gun the ray gun. People called it things like the laser gun or the zap gun, or I've even heard it called the alien gun. But it's pretty much universally accepted that the ray gun, whatever you call it, was probably the best way to get you through the early rounds. Eventually though, the zombies would break their way into the building, and at that point you were essentially doomed for certain death. There's nothing on Nocturne Toten to make the game any easier. Sure, you can acquire some slightly better weaponry as you progress through the map, but that's pretty much it. There's no perks. We're still years away from something like a zombie shield. There's no traps. It's literally just you and a gun versus the horde of zombies. And eventually those zombies were gonna break their way into Nocturne Toten and lead to your inevitable death. The next zombies map to be released was Verrocked. Although there were some additions that made Verrocked a little bit easier, it was a a little bit more player friendly in the sense that there was a power switch and that power switch once you actually opened up the entire map and got to it enabled you to have these four perks and access to traps now these are the four classic perks and everybody knows them just by looking at them even people that don't play call of duty zombies can probably instantly identify what the juggernaut machine is the two perks in the spawn area of Iraq, one being quick revive which its only purpose at the time was just that to revive people quicker and the the other one being Juggernog, of course giving you the ability to take more hits without going down. The two other perks, Double Tap and Speed Cola, would make your weapon a little bit more effective. Double Tap obviously increasing the fire rate and Speed Cola increasing your reload speed. However, despite all of these additions, it's pretty understood that Verrucked is a lot harder of a map than Nox. And why is that? Well, for one, there's no good area to actually play the game. Pretty much anywhere you stand, you're really close to a barrier. This leads to the feeling that despite Varrock being a lot bigger than Nocturne Toten, it feels a lot more claustrophobic. There's essentially nowhere to run, which makes Varrock one of the hardest, if not the hardest, early zombies map. It's impossible to talk about Varrock without mentioning the atmosphere. Varrock takes place in an insane asylum, and you can feel that while you're playing the map. Little things
things will remind you of exactly where you are while you're walking around the map. It's eerie. You could hear screams. It's honestly one of the most terrifying zombies experiences in the Call of Duty franchise. The next map in this series was the first zombies map that didn't take place in Germany. This was Shinonuma, obviously set in Japan. We were introduced to four characters, Richtofen, and Nikolai, Dempsey, and Takio, each with their own unique personality. The map takes place in a swamp with a central area that you spawn in and essentially four areas spouting out from there, each with a building at the very end of it that contains one of the four original perks. The perks being the exact same from Verrucht. However, when you open the door to each individual building, a different perk will spawn. It's completely random. As for additions to zombies here, we actually have a new weapon for the first time. This being the first real wonder weapon that isn't the ray gun. This is an electric gun that when you shoot it at a zombie, it essentially spreads to other ones, giving you the potential to kill massive hordes with a single shot. Another innovation of Shinonuma is that we have our first non-zombie enemy in the form of the Hellhound. To break the monotony of zombie rounds, now we have Dog Round, which are essentially horrifying creatures that sprint at you at full speed. However, at the end of a Hellhound round, you get a guaranteed max ammo, so it makes it all worth it. One thing notable here is that the health system on Shinonuma is very different to the other World of War maps. I'm not sure why they changed the health system here, but you can take a bunch of hits with Jug and not go down, whereas other times you can down very quickly with Jug. It, it works very strange. A lot of things about Shinonuma are very strange. There's a ton of little glitches, some of which help the player out and some of which hurt the player. Another notable thing about Shinonuma is the highest round in Zombies history was actually achieved on the World of War version of Shinonuma, which would not have been possible without the insta-kill round glitch. Our final World of War map was Duris, what most people classify as being the peak of World of War zombies. The layout of Duris is similar to Shinonuma in a lot of ways. There's a central area that you spawn in, and this time there are three areas that spout out from it. Each of the three areas has a teleporter that actually teleports you back into spawn. Once you've activated all three teleporters, you open up the Pack-a-Punch machine. The Pack-a-Punch machine is the crowning feature of Duris. This lets you upgrade your guns, giving them more firepower, letting you go to higher rounds, and makes the zombies experience so much more enjoyable. In the early days, there was two main strategies for how to play the map Duris. The first being to actually use your movement to actually train the zombies, basically running them around in circles while occasionally shooting them. This method, in theory, would essentially keep you safe for an infinite amount of time. The other strategy is what I would say most people did. You pack a punch a gun or two, and you went up and sat on the catwalk with a friend, and you just wanted to see how high of a round you can get to. Doing something like this goes back to what I was talking about earlier with Noct. This is only going to work till a certain round, until eventually you can't kill them fast enough before they actually get to you. There is an expiration date on how long you can camp in zombies. No matter how good you are, no matter how fast your reaction time is, no matter how good your aim is, eventually those zombies were going to come in on you. Darice was home to the first little easter egg in the flytrap easter egg. This little easter egg was a massive hint to where Treyarch wanted to take the mode in the future. They wanted the zombies mode to be more than just about killing zombies. They wanted to hide these little easter eggs in the map for those who had a keen eye for looking for them. I would say the World of War as a whole kind of showed that Treyarch could make a very captivating third mode and that people loved it. People wanted more and they demanded more. A little over a year passed and then Treyarch announced that they would in fact be bringing back zombies for Call of Duty Black Ops 1. Black Ops 1 tried to expand upon the original zombies formula of World at War by kind of smoothing out the edges and making it an overall better experience. Like there was a lot less glitches in Black Ops 1 than there was World at War and overall the game just felt a lot less buggy. Black Ops 1 released with two maps, the first of which was Kino Der Toten, the iconic theater map which for a lot of people when you think of Call of Duty Zombies your first thought is Kino Der Toten. Kino basically took everything that was great about World of War Zombies and ported it onto Black Ops 1. If I had to guess, I would say that Kino Der Toten is the first Zombies map played by the most amount of people. The release of Black Ops 1 saw the Zombies mode having more eyes on it than ever before. People talked about it a lot. It was no longer viewed as this distant side mode that was just kind of like, oh, it's a cool little thing that they're doing. But now for a lot of people, it was the main focus. It was the main reason why people were buying Call of Duty. The other map on disc was the map 5, a map set in the Pentagon with four very iconic 
characters. I would say five is very memorable, some for good reasons and some for bad. Some people view it as the other map. It was the other on disc map that, you know, you played occasionally, but it was always a little bit too hard or a little bit too annoying. So you just kind of let it exist and mainly only focused on Kino de Toten. While others actually took a preference to the map five, it was the more challenging little brother of the iconic Kino de Toten. The map introduced the first non-zombie type that wasn't a hellhound, of course, in the form of the Pentagon Thief. Was the Pentagon Thief necessarily loved by everyone? I mean, not necessarily. People don't like having their guns taken away, but there is a good risk to reward to the Pentagon Thief. Love him or hate him, he was at least something. They were clearly trying to expand upon the mode. While for Treyarch, Kino was the safer bet. Like, I feel like when they released Black Ops 1, they knew they had a gem with Kino Dr. Toten. They knew it was the exact type of map that the community wanted. But 5 hinted at what the game mode would become later on in Black Ops 1. They wanted to try different things, do crazy over the top stuff, like map in the Pentagon, why not? Random boss man that steals your gun, I mean, why not? Try different characters that aren't the original four? I mean, sure, we could try it because at the end of the day, we know we have this safe map in our back pocket in the form of Kino. The first DLC of Black Ops 1 was of course, Ascension. This was another what I would consider to be a safer map. There wasn't a whole lot different between a map like Ascension and Kino and you know, the maps of old of World of War. Ascension did, however, add a lot of things like there was, you know, Matryoshka dolls and Gersh devices and, you know, of course, Stamina Up and PhD Flopper. Like they basically took the original idea of zombies and added onto it. Some of the choices they made were more favorable than others, like things like the monkeys were pretty despised and are still very despised to this day. There is a risk to reward where you can actually earn more perks if you manage to go an entire monkey round without losing any, but overall it's just an annoying concept and while you're playing Ascension you're constantly like thinking in the back of your mind like oh I gotta be prepared for the next monkey round. Ascension is probably the single easiest zombies map, if not the single most, it it's definitely up there. Not only do you have the Thunder Gun returning, which I didn't mention earlier, you have Gersh devices, you have the new perks, Stamina Up makes training even easier, PhD Flopper is good to have in your back pocket, there's just a ton of things, and I haven't even mentioned the fact that Ascension's map layout is unbelievably easy. Ascension, I would say, is not the most optimally designed zombies map. There's huge, wide open areas that make it so, so easy to just run around in circles for hours and hours and hours. Like, literally anybody can do this. I feel like Ascension was designed to be the stamina up map. They knew that they wanted people to just run around at full speed with their stamina up on and just train zombies and train and train and train, which is fine. And it's fun for a few hours. Maybe you go and play Ascension three or four times, but after a while it does get a little bit boring. Ascension was perceived as being one of the great maps. As soon as it came out, people loved it. People loved it for the next few years to come. So it's a little hard for me to look back at a map that came out 10 years ago at this point and criticize it for being too easy because the community was in a lot different of a, of a space back then. The average age of a Zombies player was a lot younger during the Black Ops 1 era than it is now. The next two DLC DLC maps in Black Ops 1 kind of serve to contrast Ascension though. They were a lot more difficult, the first of which being Call of the Dead. Now Call of the Dead took the zombies formula and turned it on its head. There's no traps, there's no wonder weapon that kills to an infinite round. A lot of the areas are a lot tighter and closer corridors. You got George Romero following you around at all times to keep you from camping in one spot. The map was not easy, especially when compared to maps like Kino and Ascension. There was was a new perk called Deadshot Daiquiri that pretty much made an appearance in like seemingly every zombies map after. It basically functions to auto aim you to the zombie's head except Unfortunately, this doesn't work on PC, and the only real benefit of Deadshot Daiquiri for PC players is it does make your hip fire slightly better. All of that to say that Call of the Dead did absolutely nothing to make life any easier while playing. Call of the Dead is the only zombies map to this day that nobody has ever reached round 100 on. This is because there's a reset after a certain amount of time on Black Ops 1, and so basically after a certain amount of time, your game automatically restarts. And so it's basically impossible 
possible, or at least to this day it hasn't happened, to actually get to round 100 before your game restarts. So it just goes to show that this was an entirely different type of zombies map as something like Kino or Ascension. The next zombies map was no different in Shangri-La. It was very hard. It was even tighter corridors. You had absolutely no room to run trains. Shangri-La as a whole is just a very, very small zombies map. There's nothing on Shang to really make your life any easier other than the baby gun or the shrink ray, which essentially can shrink an entire horde of zombies into baby size. The gun technically does no damage whatsoever, but it does make zombies insta kills once they are smaller. This is genuinely one of the coolest wonder weapons of all time and easily my single favorite wonder weapon up until this point in the series. And it's impossible for me to talk about Shangri-La without mentioning it. I haven't really been talking about Easter eggs all that much because I've done two separate videos ranking all the Easter eggs, but Shangri-La has a very difficult Easter egg, especially for the time. Everything about playing co-op Shangri-La is hard. Pack-a-punch is hard. It takes a lot of communication, especially in public lobbies where it's impossible to actually talk to people. So if you have any hopes of pack-a-punching, I recommend you either playing solo or playing with friends that actually know what they're doing. Shangri-La is and was at the time especially viewed as the worst zombies map on Black Ops 1. But I think it's aged very, very well. And personally, it is my single favorite Black Ops 1 map. The very last map of the original Black Ops was Moon. And I think without a doubt, Moon is the most controversial zombies map. Either you love it or you hate it and there's literally no in between. I am personally in the latter. I hate Moon. I could go my entire life without playing Moon. But that doesn't mean that it didn't necessarily do a lot for the zombies franchise. There was an insane Easter egg culminating in in one of the craziest, if not the craziest moments in zombies history. Moon also featured what is easily the coolest spawn room, where you basically fight an infinite amount of zombies where you can gather up all the points you want before you go to round one. Or if you don't want to take that gamble, you can just go and hit the teleporter right away. And even though it might not play all that amazingly, the idea of a zombies map on the moon is unbelievably cool. Like if Treyarch can put a map on the moon, they can put a map anywhere and Moon kind of set that standard. Zombies doesn't have to be at a research Nazi facility. We can have crazy maps in literally any location possible, including the Moon. With the great success of Black Ops 1 Zombies, it was almost understood that they would bring back zombies for the next Treyarch game. And of course, when Black Ops 2 was announced, they was announced with the Zombies mode. The only question is, what would Treyarch do with the story, considering we just blew up the Earth? And that's exactly where the map transit takes place. The earth is torn apart, it's in shambles, there's zombies, it, it's basically hell on earth. The initial like first five months of Black Ops 2 zombies was not very good. Transit and Die Rise are probably the two most universally hated maps, and I would say that it's for good reason. Transit is this wide open zombies map that has like five different areas, which sounds like a great idea on paper. Unfortunately, it's unbelievably boring. There's a ton of things that hold it back whether it's the insane fog where you can't see five feet in front of you or the denizens scratching your head or the avogadro or the fact that there's no reliable way to actually move around the map the bus is too slow and you have to wait on it teleporters are both annoying to use and don't reliably get you to exactly where you want to go the choice of just running through the fog is probably the most tedious of the three because of what i mentioned before with the fogs and the denizens and the lava the pack punch system on this map is brutal to say the least. You basically place a turbine and then you run all the way to the town in hopes that the turbine doesn't break. Unfortunately, nine times out of 10, it just breaks. Like it's just that. The quote unquote wonder weapon on this map is a buildable that's very, very annoying to build because you have to travel around this giant map, which as we've already established is unbelievably annoying. And when you actually get it, it breaks super easily. With all of that said, I think transit is one of the better map to just chill back with your friends and just kind of poke fun at it. Transit is so bad that it's good. In the same way that watching a really shitty movie can be fun, playing transit with your friends can be fun. You could also play each individual part of transit or not necessarily all of them, but like three of them in like a little fun survival map that honestly can be more fun than playing the actual map transit itself. A map like town pretty much has everything from the core zombie 
zombies formula. It has four perks and a pack a punch, so if you just want to shoot some zombies, it's the perfect way to go. Black Ops 2 also released with Nuketown, which was another survival map with four perks and a pack a punch. The layout of Nuketown is sort of questionable in my mind, but it definitely can be fun for an hour or two here or there. So it's been established that Black Ops 2 didn't launch great. So what's the first DLC look like? In my mind, Die Rise is even worse than Transit because while Transit was so bad that it's good in a way, Die Rise is just bad. It's very boring and considering how cool of a location it is in a Chinese skyscraper, the map is very undersaturated and a little bland looking. Die Rise does feature one of the better wonder weapons in Zombies in the Sliquifier. It blows zombies up by shooting purple goo at it that makes them slip around. It's a very cool idea for a wonder weapon. Unfortunately though, the rest of the map is completely boring. People that defend Die Rise often use the straw man that quote, people only hate it because they're bad at parkour or whatever. But Die Rise is not a map about parkour. If jumping across like two feet is what you consider parkour, then I don't know what to tell you. The main flaws with Die Rise are honestly similar to the ones of Transit. There's no reliable way to navigate around the map. You end up spending a lot of your time while playing Die Rise just waiting on elevators. On top of this, there's just not much to do. Going for high rounds on Die Rise isn't a fun thing to do. Just playing the map casually isn't much better. The Easter egg isn't fun whatsoever. Personally, I feel like I'll just always view Die Rise as the worst of the worst as far as the wood zombies had to offer us. So like I said, the first two maps of Black Ops 2 weren't all that great, but Treyarch behind the scenes was actually working on a really good map. This would have been the first Jason Blundell directed map, and it was of course Mob of the Dead. Mob kind of changed the way that zombies works forever. No longer was it just the mode to just shoot zombies and see how long you can go. This is the first map that really, really infused story with gameplay. Pretty much everything you do on Mob of the Dead has a direct correlation with the story. If you want to get to pack a punch, you have to build the plane and escape the prison. The entire atmosphere of Mob of the Dead almost feels like hell on earth. You can really feel how the mobsters were feeling while you're playing the map, as you can kind of see that they're stuck in this endless cycle. Mob was also filled to the brim with little features, from the Golden Spork, to the Hell's Retriever and Redeemer, to one of the more iconic wonder weapons in the Blundergat and its Acid Gat upgrade. There's just always something more that you could be doing on Mob of the Dead, and this would remain a common theme in zombies, especially in all the Jason Blundell maps from this point on. But before we get to the peak of the Jason Blundell era, we actually had one more Jimmy Zielinski directed map. This was the final map of the Victus trilogy, Buried. And it was without a doubt the best map of that Victus trilogy. Buried is a western town buried underground in Africa. I mean, it's a very cool, interesting concept. You got your side ally, Leroy, that you can take around the map and do like a million different things. There's little side easter eggs. There is just a ton to do. The Raygun Mark II was introduced on this map. There's wonder weapons like the Paralyzer. There's a new perk called Vulture's Aid that's actually really good, unlike the other perks that were introduced in Black Ops 2. Unfortunately though, all of these things together does make the map a little bit too easy. But if you're the type of person that likes a casual experience from zombies, but doesn't necessarily want to play on like a small survival map, then Buried is probably the perfect map for you. And honestly, it was probably the perfect map for Jimmy Zielinski to kind of retire on. It was the perfect final chapter in the book of Jimmy Zielinski Zobby's maps. The final map of Black Ops 2 was Origins. It brought back the old characters, but now they were younger versions of themselves and further expanded on the ideas from Mob that everything you do is to accomplish a central goal. It's a very focused map and everything you do again is very linked to the story. Your goal is to save Samantha Maxis and to do that you need to build the four wonder weapons, you need to upgrade the four wonder weapons, and you need to save her from Agartha. There's absolutely no shortage of features on Origins. Like I said, the four elemental staffs, the G-strikes, the elemental fists, there's just literally a ton, like it's, it's honestly hard to get your head around. Just how much more there was to do on Origins than the maps before it. Origins really set the standard for how zombies would play out for the next several years. Because from this point on, if we didn't have all of these features, if the zombies community wasn't satisfied with the amount of content, because we knew we could get something crazy like Origins. So from that point on, we started to expect it. We started to expect there to be a ton of things to do on the map. 
And if we didn't get that, then we were not satisfied. Some people love Origins for that and some people hate it. If you were more of a fan of the classic simpler zombies from the time of before Origins, then you probably absolutely hate what Origins did to zombies. But if you're somebody who was looking for a change of zombies and wanted to see it expand into this bigger, greater mode, then it's impossible for you to ignore how great of a map Origins was. And it probably is still one of, if not your very favorite map to this day. All of the themes of Origins would carry on into Black Ops 3 Zombies. The game launched with two Zombies maps, one of which was Shadows of Evil, which would really show the direction that Treyarch wanted to take the game mode, and the other of which was The Giant a more classic style zombies map that was actually a remake of Darice. The Giant offered pretty much nothing gameplay wise that we haven't already seen, but it did have a lot of story implications. But Shadows of Evil was really where the innovations took place. Shadows of Evil takes place in Morgue City, and it takes place during the Prohibition era, but it can't be that simple, it's not just a city. The map also takes clear inspiration from Cthulhu and other Lovecraftian entities. I would say that the layout of Shadows of Evil is just about as perfect as a layout as you can get. The map is huge, but at no point do you ever feel like you're too far away from any other part of the map. That's because there is a teleporter system that I think works really, really well, where you can essentially teleport to underground from three different teleporters above. This is sort of similar to the Origins Crazy Place, but in this case, there's actually a staircase that leads above ground. There's also a train system that lets you move around the map like there's a ton of ways to navigate and i haven't even mentioned gobble gums like anywhere but here and gobble gums are a new innovation to black ops 3 they're essentially like modifiers that tie to your account people have gone back and forth for years on whether gobble gums were a good idea or not i think that the idea of gobble gums is really really good i just wish there was more of a system in place to actually earn liquid divinium rather than you know there being one challenge per day i'd much rather there been like a whole system where you get more liquid diviniums because if you don't know the system for actually earning it is you can't get a liquid divinium until like round seven and then from that point on it's like based off the amount of purchases you make it's super weird and arbitrary and i don't know if anybody necessarily understands it 100 but if there was an actual method for getting it let's say like every 1000 kills you got a liquid divinium or something along those lines every five rounds you progress you get a divinium that would have been a much better way to do gobble gum and from that point on, I probably would have had no complaints about the system. I made it clear throughout my videos that Shadows of Evil is my favorite zombies map of all time. I don't think I need to go into all of the reasons again, but just know I'm absolutely biased towards this map. Like, I, I, I really do love Shadows of Evil. The first DLC for Black Ops 3 was Jerizendrock. Jerizendrock often gets talked about as being the best zombies map of all time. It took some clear inspiration from Origins in bringing the four elemental wonder weapons and putting it onto a new game. This time the bows are a little bit easier to acquire. There's a lot less setup you have to do before you can actually get the bows. Dreisendrock, more than any of the other maps, really does take the Origins formula and just simplify it down just a little bit. This map is a very story focused map. Leading into Dreisendrock, we still didn't know if we could trust this new version of Richtofen or not, and we didn't know necessarily where the story was going. Like, we didn't know yet that we had to kill the other versions of the characters. People took guesses, but nobody actually knew for sure. So to see Dr. Groff slowly lose trust in Richtofen as the map progressed, we learned more about this new premise crew than we had on any map before, and probably any map after. The theme of going to kill the old versions of the characters would continue continue for the rest of Black Ops 3. And the first of which that we have to kill is Takio in Zetsubo no Shima. Zet is a very creepy, eerie, sort of somber map. There's a lot of cool weaponry in Zetsubo no Shima, whether it's some of the Black Ops 3 DLC guns that weren't on the other Zombies maps that only made an appearance on Zetsubo, kind of making the map stand out, or of course the Wonder Weapon, the KT-4, which is like a younger brother to the Sliquifier from earlier, or the Skull of Nansapwe, which is one of the more unique special weapons that we've ever had. Zetsubo really does give you a lot to kind of push yourself through. Zet has two unique boss fights, neither of which is 
difficult in the slightest, but they're both very unique. The first of which versus a giant spider in a literal spider cave, showing the origins of Widow's Wine. And the second, of course, was against Takio himself in an abandoned underground area of the map that really just encapsulates the creepiness of Zetsubo no Shima. The third DLC was Garad Krovi, which is just a badass map in every sense of the word. This map takes place in Stalingrad. I mean, there's dragons, there's giant Valkyrie drones, there's just a ton ton of stuff happening on this map. Grod Krovi had the third iteration of the ray gun, the ray gun mark 3, which personally is probably my favorite ray gun. Like it's it's really cool. And the map also featured one of the hardest easter eggs in zombies history, where you have to basically make your way through six challenges, a lot of which can be very difficult if you don't know the optimal strat, if you haven't played the map over and over again. And then of course the easter egg ends with a two part boss fight, once versus a giant dragon, and the second versus Nikolai himself which is just an epic epic boss fight it's very cool and was the perfect way to end this map for me so black ops 3 was kind of all building up we killed off the four original characters and it was all building up to this giant fight versus the shadow man himself and that of course took place on revelations for years before revelations people were asking for just kind of like a collage of all the different zombies maps morphed into one give us the old wonder weapons give us the old maps put it all together and just make it work. And, and I think Treyarch really executed with that. People often say that Revelations wasn't good because it wasn't innovative or that it didn't have too many new features. But I think there's something really beautiful in being able to combine all of these different things. Like just to be able to put all of those maps and make the map layout work and play like its own standalone zombies map that feels smooth is innovation in itself. Revelations also gets made fun of for, you know, having the dreaded find the rock step and, and sure that was hilarious at the time to watch YouTubers struggle for like what seemed like a, an entire week trying to figure out this Easter egg. In all honesty, I'm completely okay with it looking back. These complicated Easter egg steps that, you know, sure it feels like you're trying to find a needle in a haystack, but I think the journey in trying to figure it out is a ton of fun and it's a lot of fun to watch as somebody who's just a viewer up from the outside looking in. The culmination of the Black Ops 3 story basically ended with Dr. Mani setting the main four characters back to the Great War and completing the time loop, essentially making everything we just did completely pointless, which was kind of an anticlimactic ending and a little bit disappointing. I remember at the time, people really thought that there was like an alternate ending to Revelations, but of course that, that just wasn't true. The game was very, very good, especially for its time, and, and it still looks beautiful to this day. Like that style of video, game that almost cartoony looking aspect of black ops 3 and more specifically black ops 3 zombies just ages so well a map like revelations looks better than a lot of the zombies maps of the past you know year or two and i think it has a lot to do with the art style and, and the color and the saturation and everything just looks so good so black ops 3 ended and like three years passed and then of course they announced the black ops 4 because you can never have too many black ops games and it was at this point in the series that treyarch had so much money to work on the zombies mode. They had more resources to put into this zombies mode than any other game before it. And as the lead up to Black Ops 4 was about to happen, it was confirmed that there was going to be four zombies maps on launch. And this had like the entire zombies community just ecstatic. Unfortunately though, I don't think the launch of Black Ops 4 could have gone any worse. There is a ton of glitches on launch from blue screens to easter egg steps not working. The game was just essentially unplayable for probably like at least a month after the game came out, if not a little bit more. And that, in my mind, was the central reason for the game's demise. The game launched with two separate stories. The Ether story, which was a continuation of the story from old, with Richtofen and the crew, and we would see where their story kind of ended up. And the other was a new story called Chaos. The two Chaos maps were called Voyage of Despair and Nine, each viewed very differently. Nine, I would say, was a lot more well-received on launch, although it, like the other maps on launch, received criticism for just how complicated the Easter egg was, as well as the excessive amount of side boss zombies that spawned. When announced, a map on the Titanic sounded like a fantastic idea, but let's just say it did not meet the community's expectations whatsoever. The map layout was overly complicated, the Easter egg was overly 
overly complicated. There was too many side bosses making things overly complicated. And for the first time in Zombies history, the consensus of the community was just please tone it down, make things simpler. The ether maps weren't necessarily perceived any better. Blood of the Dead is the single most complicated easter egg of all time having players jump through hoops by completing challenge after challenge. And the Easter egg community tried for days to try to unlock the classified ending, but unfortunately it was locked behind around 150, which I personally think is a decent idea. I think 150 is a little bit too high to lock the ending to, but still. The problem was is that the game at launch, it just literally wasn't possible to get to round 50 because your game would just crash. Black Ops 4 Zombies at launch was literally just a crash fiesta. And looking back, at least in my opinion, and I know this isn't the opinion that most people have, but the launch maps of Black Ops 4 were pretty much just one to one worse than the DLC maps. It's almost like they saved the better maps for later on, assuming that the launch would be good, and it just wasn't. The first DLC was Dead of the Night, and I don't know if the zombies budget was completely depleted by this point, but there was absolutely no marketing for Dead of the Night. We literally just woke up one morning and a map dropped. I don't even think there was a trailer like a day in advance. It was really Really bad. But fortunately, the map was actually really good. The common YouTube criticism at the time was that Dead of the Night was overly complicated like the launch maps, but in reality it wasn't. In reality, the only things to build are the shield and the silver bullets, and the easter egg is relatively simple as well. The free wonder weapon is literally just enter a code into the wall. Honestly, the vibe and aesthetic of Dead of the Night alone carries it to be one of the best zombies maps, at least of that era. And Dead of the Night goes down in my top 10 zombies maps of all time. And what's crazy is, as good as Dead of the Night was, they actually outdid themselves with the next DLC, which was Ancient Evil. A map set in ancient Greece where a lot of the content in the map is very clearly inspired by Greek mythology. There's four new elemental wonder weapons that are completely different to the old staffs and the bows. While the bows I feel like took a little bit too much inspiration from the staffs, in the sense that they were actually very similar, the four gauntlets are completely unique. The Ancient Evil Easter Egg is one of my favorite easter eggs of all time. Each individual step is very tied to the lore of the map, and it ends with a very cool boss fight against Pegasus and Perseus themselves. It was by this point in Black Ops 4 that the community who was actually still left on the game, which to be fair wasn't that much, almost universally preferred the Chaos story over the old Aether story at this point. The maps were more innovative, it felt less dragged out by this point, and it was clear that the direction of the Aether story, at least for Black Ops 4, was to just keep remaking older maps. The next map was Alpha Omega, a Nuketown remake. I will say that there was a lot of hype for Alpha Omega, like definitely more than any of the other DLCs for Black Ops 4. Unfortunately though, at least for me and I think a lot of the community, the map didn't deliver on all the hype. It was essentially just the Nuketown layout with the underground that was ported over from Blackout. I would assume that they actually developed the layout for Alpha Omega before they put it into Blackout, but it released first on Blackout so it kind of feels like they just copied it over. And there's not really a ton to do on the map itself. The one bright spot however about Alpha Omega is the Raygun Mark II upgrades. They gave us four upgrades for them, four different elemental upgrades, and that's definitely really cool. However, I feel like less Less than 5% of the zombies community could actually tell you how to upgrade these four. Like nobody knows how to do it because nobody cares, like nobody played the map itself. Black Ops 4 did end on a high note. It was another remake, but this time of the beloved Call of the Dead. I think Tag Their Toten was a really good change of pace for Black Ops 4. There wasn't an overload of different mini bosses, it was pretty much just zombies that spawned in. The easter egg is very chill and relaxed and I honestly just enjoy just sitting back and doing it. It's not a difficult map, it's not a difficult easter egg, it's just very chill and laid back, which was very contrary to the rest of Black Ops 4. Unfortunately though, I personally didn't really love the wonder weapons on this map. The two wonder weapons are the Sniper Waff and the Tundra Gun remakes of the classic wonder weapons, both of which are just actually worse than the originals though, so it kind of just feels like why would I use this? In all the ether maps before TAG, I would say the remake of the wonder weapon actually improved it, but on TAG they feel like they make it worse. TAG Your Toten ends with the very final culmination of the ether story, which is a little bit anticlimactic. 
As somebody who likes the story but doesn't know every single detail of it, it feels like there could have been a solution other than them all ending up killing themselves in the end. I feel like when you're writing a story, there always has to be a better solution than that. And there had to have been some way to wrap it up in a slightly better way. Overall, I would say Black Ops 4 was a failure, and the community really was at an all-time low in the follow-up to Black Ops 4. The question in the community's mind was no longer what maps would we see in the future, but the question was, would we even see zombies in the future? Unfortunately, two years later, Black Ops Cold War was announced to have a zombies mode. The theme of zombies up until this point was each game was progressively more complicated than the last. Cold War took that and kind of flipped it upside down. This game would go ahead and simplify it and make things easier to understand for somebody that wasn't necessarily like a zombies fanatic. It did this by pretty much getting rid of buildables. I know there are some buildables, but for the most part, you can play a map without ever actually needing to build anything. Or if you do need to build something, you could just walk up to the bench, use some salvage and build it. This means that they removed the zombie shield and replaced it with the armor system, which is a lot easier to understand for somebody who's just jumping into a game of zombies. Even a acquiring the wonder weapons in cold war is a lot easier and simpler to do than it was in older games cold war also featured the return of the classic perca colas this time though they actually had tiers to them and they actually saved your account and on the menu you could upgrade them all the way up to tier 5 the game launched with three tiers and by the end it had five the new story of cold war would be called the dark ether story and, the, and its first map takes place in an abandoned nazi research facility set in morasco Poland called D Machine. I think it was the perfect map for Cold War to launch with. Its wide open areas make it very player friendly, and its easter egg is relatively simple, especially in comparison to the likes of Black Ops 4. The next map to release would be Firebase Z, which was very similar to D-Machine in a lot of ways. Again, it's at another research facility, and it's a very straightforward, simple map. Firebase Z also saw the fourth iteration of the Ray Gun in the Ray K, which was very similar to the Ray Gun Mark III in a lot of ways. It's almost like a reskin, but it, but it feels unique enough to where it definitely stands out and can be called something new. I would say that the main skill of zombies kind of changed with Cold War. Cold War is no longer about this game of trying to use your movement to keep away from the zombies, but rather it was about dealing with the different zombie types as you try to progress through higher rounds. Like you can get trapped in a corner in Cold War and be perfectly fine, but if at any point you have too many mimics or too many Russian manglers just lurking around, you can see yourself die exceptionally quickly. There was a very very long time between Firebase Z and Mauer der Toten, the next round based map. That is of course because in between the two came the most controversial thing to ever come to zombies. Outbreak is this giant open world zombies experience. You basically fight through objectives to progress through the rounds, and in my mind this is Treyarch trying to turn zombies into something different. I personally think that Treyarch with Cold War as a whole was trying to lean zombies off of round based. I think that they want to take zombies into being a more objective based mode in the future and Cold War was their way of, of kind of weaning people off. Outbreak is kind of marketed as this open world zombies where you can kind of explore and do anything you want, but if you actually do just end up exploring, it can get very boring very quickly. I think the idea of an open world zombies experience is a good idea, but I just feel like there needs to be a ton of content. There needs to be a ton of little side missions. Like I'm talking like every square inch of the map needs to be like fleshed out and filled with stuff to do, and that's just not what the Outbreak mode is. The main pieces of content in Outbreak are the two separate easter eggs but unfortunately most of the time you're doing that you end up just driving around i'm not somebody who plays games where you just drive around and basically do nothing the entire time so i don't necessarily want that in zombies am i going to disagree with you if that's something you like absolutely not but for me it just doesn't quite work out the next round based map would be mauer der toten which luckily was a breath of fresh air for cold war and without mauer der toten i think i would view cold war a lot more negatively i really do like this map i really like the wonder weapon i love the easter egg I think it ends with a really cool boss fight. There's a lot to love on this map, although it does take place in Berlin, which is kind of like a cliche place for zombies at this point. I think atmospherically, it's actually very good. I think I've probably played more Mauer their Toten than all of the other Cold War maps combined at this point. Cold War ended with Forsaken, which was an interesting choice, but I've always felt like the map layout of Forsaken was really, really held back by the amount of teleporters that it has. It almost feels like the areas of the map weren't actually supposed to go together, so they 
just kind of put teleporters around the map to kind of duct tape them together. It does have a really interesting spawn room and some very interesting side easter eggs and culminates in what is a very very cool boss fight. It's not necessarily that difficult but it's very cool. Of course that's against the Forsaken himself and this is where we see the ending of the Cold War story. Of course the final reveal is something that had been predicted for like months before in that the director is Eddie of course. Overall Cold War had some things that I really do like but it definitely does make me concerned about the future for Call of Duty Zombies. Like they clearly want zombies to be this more objective style game and we can see this right away in Vanguard Zombies that Treyarch was kind of tasked with making sort of last second. Unfortunately this objective style game gets boring very quickly for most people. Like it's okay to play as like a side mode but Zombies in the years before was being produced like it wasn't a side mode. Like from the original Black Ops to Black Ops 4, Zombies, although it was technically a side mode, it felt like its own game. And I'm concerned that the future of Zombies is Treyarch being forced to kind of make it just a side mode. Let me know what you guys think. Thank you so much for watching.